Hi, I'm Robert DeCarolee, a professor from George Mason University, and today I'm going to be talking about the monument of Chandi Borobudur. Uh, so our lecture is entitled Understanding Borobudur. First, let's situate ourselves. We are in Southeast Asia, that is the orange portions of the map, uh, which is distinguished from South Asia, which is the green portions of the map here. Uh, more specifically, we're in the nation of Indonesia. The nation of Indonesia is made up of a series of islands, and we are specifically on the island of Java. So it's in central Java that we're gonna find our main location and topic of discussion for today, uh, which is the site of Borbador. But before we talk about the monument itself, let's talk a little bit about its history. I find that my students sometimes think that history is simply a list of facts, that everything's been written in stone and all you have to do is memorize exactly what happened. The reality is that history is still a process of discovery. It's always changing, new details, new information is always being uncovered, new theories and interpretations are coming forward. And the history of the dynasties that surround the construction of Borbador has been undergoing uh, some major rethinking and scholarship. And so I thought I'd let you in behind the scenes and show you first uh, what the older characterization of the period looked like, and then show you something newer. So Javanese history between the seventh and 10th centuries CE uh, the older theory said that there was one dynasty or royal family known as the Sanjaya who were predominantly Hindu and that they ruled the region up until the 8th century, after which they were replaced by the Shailendra dynasty, uh, which was predominantly Buddhist, uh, who ruled between the 8th through 9th, mid 9th century, and this was the period in which Borobudur was built. Afterwards, the Sanjaya returned, uh, overthrew the, Sanjaya, the Shailendra, and took over the region again up until the 13th century. Now, there's been some recent rethinking of this uh, sequence of events, uh, in particular surrounding the word Sanjaya. The new theory says that Sanjaya is the name of an individual, not the name of an entire dynasty or family line. That is to say the King Sanjaya of Mataram. This is a name that has appeared in a recently discovered inscription. So if this is the case, Sanjaya and his descendants were a part of the predominantly Hindu branch of the same Shailendra dynasty. In other words, they were all related to one another, uh, but they represent different portions of the same family line. And that all of these rulers were part of one kingdom, the kingdom of Medang. Now, I think it's important that we do our best to understand who the major players were and who the major political parties were um, in this period of Javanese history. Uh, we do know that the Shailendra rulers were indeed responsible for the construction of Borobudur, but we know very little else. One of the frustrating things about studying Borobudur is that we don't have many historical documents to underscore our understanding of the monument. We don't know the names of the artists. We don't know the names of the specific individuals uh, who patronize the site. And we have very little information about its actual use. So this is where it's exciting to be an art historian because we have literally the monument itself to work with. And what we'll be doing today is looking at the actual structures, looking at how it was decorated and built, and hopefully learning as much as we can about the meaning and ideas behind the monument based on the artwork. The first thing to note is that Borobudur is not alone. Uh, it's the major architectural site for this region, but it's part of a longer processional path that goes through two other sites. One is the site of Mendut, which we'll be looking at very briefly. Then we get to the site of Pawan, which you can see in the middle of the map along the red dotted line and then culminating ultimately at the site of Borobudur, which some scholars think uh, was originally the homeland of the Shailendra dynasty. Let's look at Mendut first. Chandi Mendut uh, was built in the early, probably dates somewhere in the early ninth century, so around the same time that Borobudur was being constructed. Um, and you'll notice the word Chandi shows up a lot. I should probably clarify what that is. It, it's simply the word for temple. So it's Mendut or Chandi Mendut more formally. It's Borobudur or Chandi Borobudur. Uh, so don't get thrown by that. Uh, it simply designates the structure as a, as a religious one. Now, the site of Mendut is actually quite large and quite beautiful. Uh, it's a beautifully constructed stone temple dedicated uh, to Buddhism. And uh, we could talk a lot about its decoration, but it's not the main focus for today. So I'll just look at the exterior briefly and then let you see what's inside. Uh, in the interior chamber, we have a central image of a Buddha flanked by two bodhisattvas. Uh, bodhisattvas, as a reminder for those who don't know it, are beings who are well on their way to Buddhahood. And so they be behave and function a little bit like deities um, in other religions. That is to say, their, their wonderful good karma 
and, and their incredible virtue and kindness and compassion uh, allow them to intercede on behalf of people um, in a way that can be very beneficial. As we continue down the path, we get to the site of Chantipawan, Pawan. And it's a little bit deceptive to look at this photo. Uh, it might seem like it's the same size as Mendut, but in fact, it's much, much, much smaller. Um, a person basically fills the doorway going into the temple here. Um, and there was a lot of debate among scholars about what exactly Pawan was used for. Um, there's no main, main image inside and it's, it's not clear to whom it was dedicated. Uh, what you find if you go into the interior is a low pit. And in fact, if you look at the back, you'll notice that there's these two vents that lead outside the building. For this reason, scholars have concluded that it was used for burnt offerings, probably incense. Um, and it seems like there's a focus on the dead. So maybe it was a place to honor one's ancestors or pray to them. Um, if you look at the decoration on the back wall, you might notice the two figures who are half bird, half human. Uh, these are Kinara or Kinari, depending if they're male or female. Uh, and they are denizens in paradise. The central tree is covered with jewels. There's pots of money underneath it. So it seems like what we're looking at is a paradise scene. And because the focus is here on notions of afterlife and rebirth, um, it, the thought is that maybe this was a place to honor one's ancestors. And in some sense, it makes sense. You start with praying to the Buddha, you move next to pray to your ancestors, and ultimately you find yourself at the massive and spectacular site of Borobudur. Borobudur uh, is really unlike anything else in the Buddhist world. There's a few structures that are a little like it, but its plan, its decoration are truly unique uh, and therefore pose a challenge, right? We can't fall back on things that are familiar. We have to try and take the monument for what it presents us. And so let's start by looking big at the overall structure of the site. And then we'll start looking at the details and see if we can't puzzle together its significance. The first thing to note is that its plan is largely concentric. Uh, it has five square terraces, three circular terraces culminating in the center in a stupa. Uh, in this sense, it follows uh, the plan of something called a mandala. And a mandala is a cosmic map. Uh, they tend to be concentric. Uh, they're used in religious rites in both Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, but one of the sort of details of a mandala is that whatever's in the center is the most sacred and whatever's on the edges is the least sacred. I'm gonna argue that Borobudur follows that plan as well. And that as we move from the exterior to the interior, we're moving from the less sacred to the most sacred. And if we get to the very center of Borobudur, the very, very peak, we find a structure that's a stupa. You may be familiar with this term from other units like this great stupa at Sanchi, but for those who are unfamiliar, a stupa is a domed architectural mound created as a Buddhist shrine. Usually these are empowered by the presence of a relic or other um, uh, important remnant of the Buddha, a disciple, important teaching, text, that sort of thing that empowers the site and gives it its sacred significance. And so this is then at the very center, at the very top of Borobudur, uh, and everything else sort of leads up to it. Now, looking at it from above is only half the story. The other thing to re remember is that Borobudur has elevation. And so by looking at a cross section, we can get a sense of how the site itself is decorated. One of the things to note is that each of the square terraces has an outer wall. So that when you're walking along the square terraces, you're actually not seeing the countryside because you're in a sort of trench. It's open to the sky above, but you really can't see beyond that outer wall. You're focused on the path ahead of you and on the incredible decoration, just tons and tons of beautiful relief carvings on the walls that tell stories. And in fact, they tell specific tales um, because they're taken from specific texts. Scholars have been able to piece together exactly what books uh, are written or sorry, are depicted on the walls. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be starting at the bottom of the structure and we're gonna be working our way up to the top, looking at the narrative reliefs and trying to puzzle together what they're telling us. Uh, the first place we want to start is at the bottom. And if we want to start at the bottom of Borobudur, we have to first um, make a few things clear. First of all, you see that large, wide architectural platform at the base of the monument. We call that the architectural foot. That wasn't the original base of the building. Uh, if you see uh, on the lower left-hand corner of your image there, 
uh, when the site was reconstructed in the 1970s, uh, UNESCO and the Indonesian government did a tremendous job reconstructing Borbador. It's truly one of the great success stories of architectural restoration. They discovered that in fact, the original base of the monument had been covered over by that large platform. The reason for that isn't hard to figure out. Uh, Indonesia gets a lot of rain. And it seems that shortly after the structure was built, the interior fill began to erode and the structure began to spread. And so in order to stop it from collapsing, the architects added that large weighty platform at the bottom to make sure everything stayed in place. And so the original decoration on Borobudur then remained hidden for centuries until the restoration work took place. And so now we can get a sense of what was originally decorated at the bottom and then add that to our knowledge of the rest of the programmatic decoration at the site. And that lower level, and again, you can see here's that piece that was left unrestored. So you can see the original base, uh, tells tales that deal primarily with the concept of karma. Karma is the idea that a person's actions in this and in prior lives determine our fate in the future. So for example, if you do something good, either in this lifetime or in a next lifetime, um, you will be rewarded for that good deed. Uh, keeping in mind that Buddhists like Hindus um, believe in the concept of rebirth so that we have been through many lifetimes before this one and we will be going through uh, other lifetimes in the future. Uh, the other side of karma is that if we we're, we're do terrible and mean things, well, we're gonna pay a price for that as well. Uh, we may even end up in a heaven or a hell, but again, neither of those places in the Buddhist concept of it is permanent uh, because ultimately the good deeds that got us into heaven are gonna be used up and then we'll be reborn again. And if we're in hell, sooner or later, we're gonna pay for our bad deeds and then we'll get a chance to try again. So the text is a text called the Karma Vibhanga. And it's pretty straightforward in its morality. It's the kind of morality you might use to reprimand a child um, or um, the kind of carrot and stick <laughs> motif uh, where if you do something bad, something bad happens to you. And if you do something good, it tells you what your reward will be. Um, so for example, here we're seeing scenes on the left side um, in the second panel, uh, you can see that there's a man with a sword striking down a woman. In the text, this is a man killing his own mother. And his punishment is directly to the left of him where you see someone hurling him headlong into a burning white hot iron house. Uh, he's gonna be burning in hell for millions and millions of years, right? So here's the action, here's the consequence. If we move to the other portion of it, we see people boiling uh, turtles alive. And as a consequence, they're gonna have some to spend some time getting boiled alive some themselves. So there's, a, there's the idea here that um, if you do something cruel, something much worse is going to happen to you to pay for it until you've paid for your crimes, in which case then you might have a chance to try again. Now, on the opposite side of things, we have good deeds. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a panel depicting a party, uh, and I'll show you a detail of it. You can see it's one heck of a party. Uh, we have a conga line forming, we have people drinking alcohol, uh, a couple in the, bot in, the, in the center getting a bit frisky, uh, all of these things indicating that there's a lot of alcohol being drinking, uh, drunken and a party going on. Now, if we go back to the original image here, you'll notice that on the far left of the panel, there's a, there's a man and two women who are turning away from the scene. They're looking the opposite direction. And we know from the Karma Vibhanga that we're being told that these are people who are practicing temperance. They are not participating in the excessive consumption of alcohol. For Buddhists, Drinking alcohol is, is not in itself something that produces bad karma, but you're voluntarily giving up control of your own moral behavior, right? You're voluntarily choosing uh, to um, put yourself in a position where you might make choices that harm others. And so in that sense, it is something that is to be avoided. And by avoiding it, we'll notice that the individual gets rewarded. Well, where's the reward here? Notice the tree. The trees tend to separate the before and after moments of these stories. And so uh, as we saw in the other panel I showed you, the tree here, if we look to the right of it, you'll notice that the individual is now seated on a high platform. He is, uh, looks wealthy and he's got uh, piles of, uh, or I should say jars of wealth underneath, sorry, underneath him. Well, the people around him have their hands cupped open. They're asking him for favors he's now wealthy and wise. And so as a result of foregoing alcohol, he's been rewarded with wisdom, authority, wealth. Okay. Now, 
At this point, we're going to walk up the steps. And we walk up the steps, we're going to enter the second terrace. Well, if our first level is these stories of karma, what do we encounter next? Well, two types of stories. They're called Jatakas and Avadana tales. Both of them are fun, exciting stories that always have a moral message. Okay, they're a little bit like, if you're familiar with fables, they, they read often a little bit like that. The distinction between a Jataka and Avadana is that a Jataka is specifically about the past lives of the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha, like all of us, had multiple past lives, but in each of them, he was really incredibly virtuous. And so he serves as a kind of moral example. And in some of these stories, he's born as a human, and some of them he's born as an animal, um, but in all of them, there is a moral message at the end. Avadana tales are similar, they're often a bit longer, um, and they feature people other than the Buddha. So uh, I don't have time to show all, you, all of the stories here, that some of them can be quite complicated, uh, but I thought I would show you one. Uh, this is the Shibi Jataka. In this particular story, uh, the future Buddha is born as a king named Shibi. And he's posed with a very unusual and very specific problem. You'll notice that Shibi in this image, who's seated in the pavilion, has a bird on his right shoulder, or maybe it's on his throne, but anyway, you can see the bird there. And then if you look at the tree over to the left, there's a hawk seated in the tree. Here's the story. King Shibi is sitting at home uh, and a little dove or pigeon flies in through the window and says, your majesty, your majesty, uh, please give me your protection. And he says, of course, you're one of my subjects. I would never let any harm come to you. And so the bird sits there quite content. A mere split second later, a hawk comes flying in the window and says, your majesty, did you see a dove come in here? That was my lunch. And the king says, I'm, I'm sorry, hawk. I can't let you eat this bird. Um, he's under my protection. And the hawk looks at the king and says, but your majesty, aren't I one of your subjects too? Are you gonna let me starve? Why is it right that I should suffer just because you're protecting that bird? And so now the king has a moral dilemma. He wants to avoid harming anyone, but by choosing to protect one, he inadvertently harms the other. So how does he get out of this dilemma? Well, let's pan out and see what the image shows us. Look over to the left hand side and I think you'll see that there's a giant scale. Notice that there's that uh, two plates. One of them has a bird sitting in it. That's the dove, the pigeon shown a second time. So what does this mean? Shibi has the dove weighed he finds out exactly how much that dove weighs. And then taking a knife, he cuts off a portion of his own leg equal in weight to the dove and gives it to the hawk to eat. So in this way, he protects both of his subjects. The hawk doesn't starve, the dove remains safe. And so by undergoing self-sacrifice, he shows what a true leader should be like. Someone who puts the welfare of his subjects over himself, right? That his selflessness ultimately preserves uh, the morality of this tale. Okay, so that's one story among many and there are others like it, but we have then these scenes of the past lives of the Buddha and other great Buddhists doing moral things. These are fun stories, but they have a message. Now, I should say too that, you know, I wanna show you that, that these reliefs are, first of all, they're beautifully carved. Secondly, they have historical details that we simply would not know about if it wasn't for these beautiful carvings. Uh, we know, for instance, that the Shailendra had a very powerful navy. We know that they controlled trade routes through the region, that they um, had all kinds of wealth coming in because of their shipping networks. But we had no idea what their ships looked like. On these kinds of relief panels, we actually get a beautiful look at what the sailing ships of the Indonesians of this period looked like. Um, and so, again, this is a bit of a tangent, but I think it's important to recognize that these um, relief carvings are more than just stories. They're also historical documents in and of themselves. Okay, so returning to our terrace, we are now walking through our trenches and we're going about to go up to the next level. And if the, pa if the past lives of the Buddha was the subject of the second terrace, going up to the third terrace, what do you suppose we're going we're gonna to encounter? Well, the life of the Buddha himself. And in fact, that test, text is called the Lavita Vistara. There are several stories which tell portions of the life of the Buddha. And the Lavita Vistara is one of the major sources of that. It tells his, uh, the story of his life from his conception all the way through till his enlightenment. 
Uh, and in fact, that's what we're seeing here is the very beginning of the story. Um, the woman reclining at the top is Queen Maya. That's the Buddha's mother. And she is dreaming. We know this because the story tells us that on a warm night, she went out to a balcony uh, on her palace to sleep. And as she slept, she had a dream that a white elephant entered her side. Um, and the dream interpreters told her when she woke up that that meant that she was pregnant with someone very important. Well, let's take a look at how the artists have rendered it. Uh, I should say that in this artwork, uh, important figures are never alone. Uh, you can always tell someone of significance because they always have an entourage with them. Um, and so even though in the story, Queen Maya is alone, here there's lots of people around the palace watching and waiting. Uh, and if you look to the upper left, you can see a really amusing depiction, partially damaged, of the elephant coming flying in. He looks a little bit like a helicopter, but that's not a propeller over him. Uh, that's actually an umbrella or a parasol. Um, important individuals, kings, princes, great religious figures, uh, often had people carrying a parasol or umbrella over their head. It's, it's in many ways a mark of kingship. Um, and you'll notice too that underneath the elephant, uh, under his feet are two lotuses lifting him up in the air. And so this is the artist attempting to show us the dream that Queen Maya has in which the elephant flies into her side. Um, and so we know unequivocally through this, this iconography that we're looking at the dream of Queen Maya. Now, if we fast forward the story, uh, the individual who will become the Buddha grows up as a prince. Uh, his name is Siddhartha Gautama. He lives the first part of his life in great splendor and wealth, but ultimately he decides to give it all up to pursue a spiritual life. And so here we see the moment where he has left the palace and he's now going to begin his life as, a, as an ascetic, as a holy man, and he's cutting off his long hair, taking off his royal turban, uh, getting rid of his royal clothes, and beginning the life uh, of a renouncer, uh, the life that will ultimately lead to his becoming the Buddha. And so you can see he's got one hand raised, he's holding onto a lock of hair, and the hand that's broken would have been holding a knife that he'd be using to cut off the hair that's there. Um, in this case, we can see all kinds of people are around him. Uh, many of these probably represent the deities who were present for these events. Uh, the hair, the turban, both of which became very important relics uh, later in the later history of Buddhism. Uh, and speaking of becoming the Buddha, uh, the one more scene I'd like to show you here, this is the scene of the Buddha's enlightenment, or at least the beginning of his enlightenment. It's the, the moment where uh, he overcomes worldly uh, desires and fears uh, and begins the path that to, the, to what will ultimately earn him the title of Buddha. Um, one's not born a Buddha, you earn that title by attaining a state of enlightenment um, and teaching it to others. And so here we're seeing a moment where a god of desire named Mara does not want him to succeed, right? He's worried uh, that the Buddha will lead people out of the world and that Mara will lose some of his power and authority. Uh, and so Mara first tries to tempt him with his daughters and then later tries to attack him with his army. Um, but ultimately, the Buddha is immune to both fear and desire. And so here he touches the earth with his palm turned inward um, calling up the earth to bear witness to all of his past lives, um, quieting the attack of Mara and allowing him to focus, um, beginning what will ultimately become uh, his enlightenment. Okay, so we've now come up and I think it's worth considering where we've been so far, starting with very basic tales of karma, you know, rewards and punishments, rewards and punishments, to fun stories that have a moral message, to the past lives of the Buddha, to the life of the Buddha himself. So we're done, right? We've reached the enlightenment of the Buddha, right? What more is there possibly to say? Well, we've got two more levels left, so let's see. We'll go up the next set of steps. And this is where we encounter a rather surprising text, the Gandavyuha. The Gandavyuha is not about the Buddha. It's about an ordinary person, an ordinary person just like you or me, who was a merchant, his name's Sudana. And Sudana decides that although he's been successful in life, he wants to become enlightened. He, it's not enough to recognize the importance of the Buddha, he wants to emulate the Buddha, right? And so the next challenge, the next sort of moral or ethical uh, struggle on the path up Borobudur is how do we become enlightened ourselves? And so uh, what follows over the next two levels um, are scenes from the Gandavyuha. Frankly, they're a little bit repetitive, it's often, uh, Sudana bowing in front of a pavilion in which there's a teacher. 
Um, and he goes from teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher, and he learns little lessons from each of them on his path. Ultimately, though, he, he struggles to find um, a teacher who can really open the way to enlightenment for him. That is until he comes across an individual named Maitreya. Now, Maitreya is very famous because Maitreya is a bodhisattva who will be the next Buddha, right? He's, he is on deck, ready to become the next Buddha. And so he's sort of the perfect person to learn how to become enlightened from. And, and here we see Sudhana standing on the right with his entourage. We see Maitreya seated in a pavilion and he's preaching to the animals. And so you can see he's surrounded by all kinds of wildlife um, listening to his wisdom. In the scene, uh, we find Sudhana um, starts a conversation with Maitreya. And Maitreya talks about enlightenment as crossing a threshold, as entering into a special kind of hall or pavilion. And uh, for uh, Sudhana right now in this scene, we see that hall is closed, right? The door is shut. He is, uh, he, it's, it's inaccessible to him. Uh, but eventually though, we see that Maitreya shows him the way. Maitreya uh, gestures into the structure. Um, he is um, opening the path through his teachings, leading Sudhana to the state of realization. And now for the first time, we see Sudhana who's seated directly uh, to the right of um, Maitreya seated upright. His hand is up to his chest. He's looking alert. And in fact, at this point in the story, Sudhana himself does attain enlightenment. Uh, and the text can be a little bit um, poetic. It can be a little bit metaphorical and, and, and dreamlike in some of its sequences. But we know that, that at this point, uh, Sudhana has uh, attained a state of, uh, rev of in insight and re uh, revelation. So uh, what happens on the structure? Well, guess what? We go up one through, through one final doorway and now the entire countryside opens up to us. Now for the first time, we're out of those trenches. We're out on the upper circular terraces and we can see the entire countryside stretching out around us. And we find ourselves in a forest of uh, stupas. You'll notice that the stupas, the lower stupas are perforated. That is to say they have holes in them. Uh, we have two rows in which the uh, holes are, are diamond shaped and then the upper level, which are square shaped. In each case, uh, these are um, aligned in rough circles. Only the middle circle is a true circle, right? If you look at them from above, the, the lower, so the first and second circular tier are a little bit um, oval shaped or a little bit flattened on the edges. And then only the central one is a perfect circle leading up to the stupa in the middle. So we're moving up towards a state of unity, towards a state of perfection as we get to the top of the stupa. But these little stupas, the ones with the holes in them, they have another surprise for us. Because uh, if we take a close look, right, if we sort of press our noses up against the stupas and look inside them, you might notice there's Buddhas inside. And each of these Buddhas makes the same gesture. They're making a teaching gesture, uh, the same gesture that he makes uh, when he gives his first sermon. So this is an important teaching gesture or mudra uh, that the Buddha makes. Now, this isn't technically the first Buddhas that we've seen at the site, because if we go down to the bottom again, and we look up above the narrative scenes, there's actually been Buddhas the whole way. Um, I didn't go into the details of them. Oh, here's another view that when they restored the site, they left um, some of them unfinished so that people could see the Buddhas more clearly. Um, but as we were going up through the square terraces, if we looked up above them, there's a series of small niches. And in these niches, are Buddha images. And depending what side of the structure we're on, they make a different hand gesture. So for example, all the ones to the west make the meditation gesture or dhyana um, gesture. The ones on the east make the earth touching, right? Or the Bhumishparsa mudra, which is the, the earth touching gesture. The ones to the south make this gift giving gesture known as varada and the ones to the north make the apaya, approach without fear, the fearless gesture. And so we have then different versions of, uh, or different gestures on each of the four sides on the lower levels. Um, some people have argued that in fact, we're talking about forms of Buddhism where there are multiple Buddhas. And so these are multiple directional Buddhas that these might be um, a multiplicity of different Buddhas. But as we move up the structure, something interesting happens. On the fifth level, 
no matter what side we're on, they're all making the same gesture, vitarka, which is the lecturing gesture. It's another variation on teaching. And then ultimately, as I mentioned already, when we get to the top, all of this, the Buddhas are making the teaching gesture. So what's going on here? Well, we're moving from multiple Buddhas to a singular gesture, to a Buddha that's merging with a stupa, to ultimately a solid stupa at the top. So I think just as we're going from sort of the least sophisticated moral messages up to attaining enlightenment ourselves, our Buddhas are going from multiplicity into singularity as they're merging into the form of the perfected stupa at the top. And so one of the things that's consistent, no matter how we approach the monument, is that we're moving from the least sacred to the most sacred. Further down, further out is the most rudimentary, the most simple lessons, um, ones that preserve notions of difference and distinctions between things. But as we move up, we're challenged first with tales of karma, then with moral stories that, that teach a good lesson but are fun to listen to. Then we get the life of the Buddha. Then we get the hard work of becoming like a Buddha. And as we move up too, we're moving more and more towards that singular central point of the stupa, which is the point of perfection at the top. So I hope this overview has helped you understand Borbador. It can be a confusing monument at first, um, especially since we don't have many historical details. But if we take the time to look carefully at the programmatic decoration, we'll find that the sculptors and, and um, patrons of the site left us a very clear message about the meaning of the monument. And I hope this helped to clarify it for you as well. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.